Welcome to our webinar on patellofemoral pain. It occurred on 7th of, 7th of August in 2020 at 5 p.m. Australian Eastern Time. The webinar was in two parts. The first is a keynote presentation by Dr. Mark Matthews on his clinical trial of foot orthoses versus hip exercises for patellofemoral pain. The second is a question and answer panel discussion with Mark and four leading international authorities on this condition. It ran over two hours. So for the recordings, I've split the webinar into two parts. The first part, the first webinar recording you will view is Mark's presentation and some very excellent question and answers. The second part is the panel question and answers session with some very practical insights into how to manage pain, patellofemoral pain, uh, from leading international experts on the condition. Before we commence, I would like to acknowledge the support of UQ, the NHMRC, the National Health and Medical Research Council of Australia, and Vasily and Vionix for providing support. This research that Mark did takes funding and a lot of support and we're very grateful for this support. We're even more grateful that we're able to do the research independently of the support. UQ provides all the infrastructure and necessary support to undertake research to the highest standards and to train the next generation of physiotherapists, both researchers and specialist musculoskeletal and sports physiotherapists. Hence the information on this slide of our master's program. Applications are now due. An interesting point is Mark, our keynote today, is a graduate of this program. The NHMRC funded the project uh, in the main, and it did so through its program scheme. Vasily and Vionix provided orthoses and footwear, and they also provided some funds to meet the full cost of the study. As I stated before, the research was conducted independently of any of this support. So without further ado, I'd like to um, make a very uh, warm welcome to Dr. Mark Matthews, presenting his clinical trial on patellofemoral pain. I trust you'll enjoy uh, the story behind the FOX trial, the rationale and the findings, and in particular, the question and answer session that occurred afterwards. It was thoroughly enjoying and could have gone on for a lot longer. As I said, great pleasure to introduce Mark Matthews, our keynote for uh, the evening or, or this presentation. Um, Mark is, uh, is a journeyman, or in other words, he's traveled the world. He, he graduated at the University of Otago um, in New Zealand a few years ago. Uh, he first came to us, uh, known to us as a master of physiotherapy a student in musculoskeletal physiotherapy here at the University of Queensland. Um, he, uh, and I welcome all master's students. Uh, our students that are undertaking the sports masters are, are, are looking in on this uh, presentation as attendees today. Um, and, uh, and also all master's students and, and students around the world uh, that uh, have taken time to look at this presentation. So he was uh, very memorable. He's energetic, Mark, is, as you'll see from his presentation, uh, and uh, maybe wasn't smart enough to stay away from the place, came back and did a PhD. And, and what we're seeing tonight is the end product of his PhD. Now, Mark's got extensive international clinical experience. Um, he's worked across many different public and private health sy uh, systems. He's, rep he's represented um, his country as a physiotherapist at uh, Commonwealth Olympic Games and World Championships, particularly in cycling. Um, he's currently a professional uh, with a professional ice hockey team and is a lecturer at the uh, University of Ulster where he uh, is the director of the Master of Sports and Exercise Medicine um, there um, and uh, has got many, many research projects. He's moved on, his major one currently is concussions in rugby union. So, um, I think without further ado, Mark's uh, going to um, present his, uh, his study um, uh, on
on uh, patellofemoral pain. Uh, and uh, once I find my um, my um, um, uh, control items, Mark, I'll disappear. And uh, with great uh, pleasure, I'll allow you to um, tell us all about your studies, mate. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much, Bill. Um, everyone can, I'm assuming everyone can see the screen. Everything's running well. Um, it's all up there. Okay, lovely. Um, team, I am absolutely fizzing to be able to present these results to you. Uh, it's been a real labor of love for me uh, and for this research team. It's been a lot of work invested by a lot of people. Um, in fact, seven years, but I'll give you a wee story behind that one as well. Um, as Brad has so already chipped in, uh, I'm a little bit notorious for telling a good and engaging story that can run a bit longer. So I'll try and keep this as focused as I can and not run off on a tangent. But look, I'm absolutely thrilled that you're here, that you can watch, you can listen, uh, and let me tell you a story uh, and walk you through you know, where we're at and what we did with this research. Um, Bill, thank you so much for the introduction and to the panel members, again, thank you very much for joining in. And of course, all of the attendees, good morning, good afternoon, and welcome. Uh, and a tip of the hat to a few of my good friends who have chipped in to come and watch me speak. And uh, hard to believe that I think it was nine years ago that we first met and thought PhD was a ridiculous idea. But here we are. Okay, lovely. Um, I would just like to echo Bill's comments around the financial support that we've received from the Australian government, uh, NHMRC. Really grateful to have that and to be given that sort of opportunity. Uh, and also the support that was given through Vasily through the products and the money that they helped to give us. Uh, as Bill said, they weren't engaged in any part of the research. They just provided us with the stuff. Okay, lovely stuff. Coffee in hand. Um, I'm certainly going to need one uh, as we go through, whether it's a tea, coffee, uh, some other caffeinated drink. So please sit back and enjoy. Uh, I hope that this is curious, gives you a bit of inspiration, maybe gives you some ideas and think about the way we do things. One of the first things, um, I was a real curious little wee kid. I was into everything. I wanted to know why. I wanted to understand stuff. Really thought like, I really need to understand, you know, I was awesome at Cluedo, who killed who with a candlestick. Uh, and that's come through into my clinical training and, and being a physio, trying to get to the bottom of understanding the why of things. You know, why do we do stuff? So through my experience, you know, we had access to a lot of phototheses, exercises and things for lower limb pathologies. And patellofemoral pain was one of the most common ones that I was seeing at the time. So I couldn't understand, well, why did one guy respond? Why did one guy not? What is actually the best management for these sort of things? So hopefully through this talk, you know, the why starts to illuminate some light bulbs for you. I certainly had mine through this plan, through the story, through the project as well. So I'm hoping you'll have some wee light bulb moments, things that may resonate with you, things that you maybe didn't know before. Maybe also challenge some of the biases that you may have picked up over time. I'd just like to again acknowledge and say hello to all of the master's students, previous and past and present. Do not worry about your OSCE. Bill's not as tough as he looks, right? Um, but anyway, thanks. Good luck, guys, and hope it goes well. As Bill's mentioned, I'm at University of um, Ulster University. I'm a lecturer in Masters of Sports and Exercise Medicine. Uh, I work with the Belfast Giants as a professional ice hockey team and also involved in a private practice, a replay sports clinic as well. It's really important to understand that it, this is an evolution of knowledge and we're presenting this project to you, but it's built on the shoulders of giants. There's been a lot of great work that's been done prior to this, other, other randomized controlled trials that have led up to this point here. And our understandings is always evolving. We start to get a little more, bit more pieces of the puzzle. So I'm hoping today that I can show you a few more pieces of the puzzle, maybe start to see with some challenge some pieces that are there that you you know maybe have thought of or taken for granted just a little bit. So here we go. So patellofemoral pain is a characteristic presentation. The patient will usually port, report the presence of retropatella or pain around the kneecap or underneath it. It's usually aggravated by activities that load up the patellofemoral joint and typically it's squatting, you know, going up and down stairs, you know, other functional tasks that load the joint and the flexed uh, the flexed joint and load up the patellofemoral joint. But it's also a diagnosis based on exclusion of ruling out all the other pathologies that we might see and you know, happen around the knee. You're kind of left with this clinical presentation. It's prevalent, you know, there's various studies have given different prevalence rates, but 25% seems to be around about the most commonly reported figure. Um, and it occurs across the lifespan, right from adolescent right through to senior uh, citizens as well. 
it's also a really persistent condition and different studies have shown within adolescence, you know, two years later, more than 50% are still reporting persistent symptoms. And certainly other studies have shown five to eight years after being enrolled in the clinical study, over 50% are still reporting some sort of persistent symptoms that they're experiencing. So it's a real recalc recalcitrant one and quite a sticky one and it's common. So it's a really good one to get out and understand the why of it. Its etiology is kind of unknown, but it's regarded as a multifactorial condition. And by that we mean it's got lots of pieces to the puzzle, a lot of contributors. And historically, it's kind of been viewed with a biomechanical or a neuromuscular rationale, some sort of consideration for load or overload around the knee, some sort of movement coordination type issues, some muscle performance error, um, deficits, but also something around mobility impairments, whether maybe too much or too little movement in certain joints. But there's this growing body of research that's starting to come out that's also highlighting the psychological contributors towards the patellofemoral pain. And those that present with it, you nearly read, need to be thinking about these three major domains when you're treating somebody. Now, historically, it's kind of been viewed as a local joint around the knee, but the evidence is really growing to show that there's this top down, these proximal drivers to patellofemoral pain, as well as distal mechanisms down at the foot towards the knee that seem to have an influence around the patellofemoral joint. Approximately, you know, if we uh, proximal around the hip joint and pelvic area, there's, you know, classic signs that we may see within literature is this contralateral pelvic hip drop, the sort of femoral internal rotation and adduction, which presents to us with like a dynamic pelvis. And that's things that we'd commonly see within clinic. We get someone to do a single leg squat and we're looking or thinking about that sort of dynamic knee movement as they squat. More distally though, you know, historically it's been shown around excessive motion at the foot. You may call it pronation or just excessive mobility occurring at multiple joints around the foot. That can have an influence on the tibia and it creates greater internal rotation, which then impacts upon the tibiofemoral joint, which then indirectly impacts upon the patellofemoral joint. So this again, this sort of dynamic valgus presentation occurring at the knee. Typically what we would see and think about and consider historically is this sort of joint stress through the patellofemoral joint. In a, in a normal situation, the patella is tracking lovely through the trochlear groove. Forces are digest, uh, distributed equally throughout the medial and lateral facets. Now, as a result of the dynamic knee valgus, what's actually happening is not necessarily the patella tracking laterally, it's actually the femur and the trochlear groove underneath rotating more medially. The way I describe that is like a train running on the tracks. It's not necessarily the train moving off the tracks, it's the tracks moving away from the train. Now the thought is that that results in far more joint stress more laterally and results more of compressive stress. Same amount of force, but just on a smaller area, therefore kind of creates greater joint stress. And this has been presented before around this pathomechanical model. And you'll see down the bottom, sort of driving this presentation is impaired hip and muscle performance, as well as around the trunk and the pelvis, sort of causing these sort of movement patterns further up. But also you'll down see down the bottom is altered foot and ankle, you know, particularly strength, structure, mobility, these sort of considerations. It's important to note here though, that elevated joint stress doesn't correlate directly to pain. There's a lot of other factors that have to happen between joint stress and the presentation of pain. And I just wanna make sure that you're aware that there's a lot more mechanisms to this further higher up the chain. Things that we need to consider about a bit more as well. So here we come to the management of patellofemoral pain. You know, how do we manage it? And it's at this point here, I'd just like to take a quick second look. If someone typically presents to me in clinic with patellofemoral pain, where do I normally start? You know, where do I go when I start treating someone with patellofemoral pain? What are some kind of the key things I will look at and why? Just have a quick think about that. Lovely, okay. So, patellofemoral pain, as we know, presents, you know, this sort of peripatellar retro pain, uh, retro patella type pain. There's international consensus guidelines around the treatment of it. There's been this recent publication of the clinical practice guidelines that's been published in JOSP by Willie et al. And there's been a lot of guidelines about how to sort of the optimal management of it. And there's been six key recommendations. Within those six key recommendations is a suggestion of focusing on exercise therapy, particularly up around the hip and pelvis, targeting that sort of post musculature, sort of addressing that. And there's a real sort of recommendation that we should be addressing that sort of thing. 
Equally though, within the recommendations is the suggestion that some may benefit from photothoses and it may have an impact, you know, sort of short-term pain relief. So what we've got is evidence saying, look, well, there's theoretical rationale for top down and exercise therapy to target that. Conversely, more at the foot, the suggestion of excess mobility and photothoses, which kind of you think, all right, here's a device that's designed to sort of control or manage the mobility. If we look at the evidence around that, there's a certain growing body of evidence. You know, studies have shown that hip exercises gives a superior benefit to just pure knee focused exercises. So there is the evidence showing that this treatment does work. Conversely, with the foot orthoses, there's evidence from studies and massive RCTs showing that this, you know, foot orthoses do have an effect and can help reduce pain. The interesting thing that here in my head is like, well, hang on, we've got two different options. I've got a bottom up or a top down. You know, so where do I kind of go with those? So if someone presents to me with patellofemoral pain, the guidelines are saying, look, do top down, do bottom up, but well, where do I start? You know, what do I sort of manage or which one's best if I don't do anything and just make a diagnosis of patellofemoral pain? What's my best tool to use? So that was one of our first questions that we came up with. It was like, well, which is actually better? If I just, someone comes in, where do I start with somebody? Not trying to tailor it, just think, where do I start? So that was one of the first questions with this big trial that we ran. The second thing is, well, look, studies have shown that there's a small group of people who've responded brilliantly to that treatment, whilst others in the same group haven't responded as well. So there's this idea about this sort of subgroups that respond well to one specific treatment. So these best practice guidelines that was put out by Bartnet in 2015, you know, it's sort of a consensus statement, but of an evidence based sort of merging thoughts, clinical practice, and the evidence, came up with four key overarching principles. Number one was that we should be individually tailoring treatment. Number two, focus on getting an immediate pain relief to help to get the patient engaged and get the buy-in. Number three, patient empowerment, get them engaged into the treatment with a suggestion that we should be focusing on active over passive interventions. And the fourth one, is around patient education and activity modification within the context of what that patient is doing, the person is doing. Now this, the last, the, sorry, if we jump to actually the first one, we'll, the individually tailoring, well, actually how do we do that? If I'm gonna tailor a treatment to somebody, what are the things I want to be looking for? And now what we would call treatment effect modifiers. Okay. These are things that you guys have already been kind of looking at, but this is the term for them. It's a patient characteristic that's associated with a successful outcome to a specific treatment. So we then did a systematic review and looked at it, right? Well, look, what does the evidence actually suggest? What has been shown and reported before to be these sort of potential treatment effect modifiers that may help me sort of tailor my treatment a bit better. So the study, we looked at baseline characteristics that were associated with one, a poor patient outcome, a prognostic factor, and two, treatment effect modifiers. So, you know, they modify the patient outcome from a specific treatment. If we look at the poor prognosis, there's 12 studies that we captured in this review, with 16 characteristics that were associated with a poor prognosis. But by far the most consistent one was duration of symptoms. The longer that someone has had the symptoms, the more likely they are to have a poor prognosis. And this cutoff of around about more than four months of symptoms, this person's starting to head towards having a poor outcome. If we look at the second part, which was looking at the treatment effect modifiers, we found 12 studies that had sort of reported treatment effect modification. From that, there were six treatments that were looked at, and predominantly it was foot orthosis. Of the 12 studies, six of them focused on, you know, treatment effect modifiers for foot orthosis. There was two studies that looked at a lumbopelvic manipulation and the rest of them were single studies standalone, looked at things like neural mobilization, stretching and leg press, other sort of local exercises, things around the knee. But by far the most common one was with foot orthoses. It was the main treatment that had been looked at. Across those six treatments, 22 characteristics were associated with a successful outcome were, were reported from these studies. 14 of them were associated with photothoses. There's always a but with research and there was a big but with this research that came through. There was two really crucial methodological considerations from all those 12 studies that had been presented. There was this overfitting of data to the sample size. What that means is they'd collected a heap of measurements and applied it to a very small sample. 
The second thing is was this absence of a comparative treatment, something of equal or comparable sort of effect or comparable sort of success rate, sorry, comparable evidence-based treatment. All of these studies were missing this. They weren't able to compare it to something. They just took a group with patellofemoral pain, gave them a treatment, looked at those that responded really well, and looked back at the baseline characteristics and sort of what separated them from those that didn't respond and then reported it saying, look, this was associated with success. So what those two limitations mean is that there's a much higher risk of what they reported with spurious findings and were not truly reflected within a clinical population. However, one of them did show up as quite a potential treatment effect modifier and it's this thing called midfoot width measurement. To talk you through what that is, you take the person, you get them to stand up on a platform and you um, put the heel back into the cup and you measure the total length of the foot from the heel to the toe. At the halfway point or half the length, you then draw a line across the top of the foot and define that as midfoot. You then use a set of calipers and measure the width of the foot in a weight bearing position. You then measure it again in a non weight bearing position, exactly the same line perpendicular to the sole of the foot. And you'll end up with this difference the difference in the width between weight bearing and non weight bearing. And what two studies reported and they showed was this consistent measurement of around about 11 millimeters difference or more. Meaning that if you had more difference in this foot, if you had greater movement or greater mobility through the foot, you're more likely to have a successful outcome with foot orthoses intervention. So the deal is look, it seems to be something about mid foot width mobility it seems to be associated with success foot orthoses. And it had to be tested against the comparable intervention. A la the FOX trial, foot orthoses versus hip exercises for patellofemoral pain to see if foot mobility was associated with outcomes. For those that want to get a bit more into the methodology, this our protocol has been published. This is it here. Um, if you can't find or access it, please feel free to send Bill or I an email and we'll forward it out through to you. From here on in, we're going to be now talking about the FOX trial itself. So hopefully I've explained the rationale, the reasoning and kind of why we looked at it. You know, it also, also drove me to do it from a clinical point of view and a curiosity point of view, especially curiosity. Um, so from here on in, we're now going to be presenting the study and what we did. So here we go, FOX trial. It was conducted a multi-site. It was conducted in Australia and Brisbane and also in Olborg in Denmark with the assistance of Michael. And Michael, thank you so much for being involved. Really appreciate all that you did during this uh, trial and especially for me. We used the definition and the sort of classification of patellofemoral based on a consensus statement. So we had the inclusion criteria that was adults aged between 18 and 40 and was with patella diagnosis of patellofemoral pain based on a non-traumatic origin of symptoms, uh, greater than six weeks duration. It was provoked by activities that load the patellofemoral joint, you know, such as running, squatting, up and down stairs and jumping. And they had to report more than three out of 10 pain over the last seven days. So there's this kind of consistent, persistent pain presentation. And as I mentioned, it was a diagnosis based on exclusion of other kind of concomitant knee pathologies or something else that may be going on. And we were We then wanted to look to see, well, look, what did the evidence show around, you know, what was a good hip exercise protocol? But also we wanted to make sure it was clinically feasible, both, you know, we were very strong in this. It's like, look, if this study works, we want to show that you can do it in clinic, straight off the horse's uh, out of the horse's mouth, and, you know, off the bat, you can use it straight away. So we found that the Fukuda protocol was very good. It was, you know, we managed to restrict it down to 30 minutes. Uh, and we also selected the photothesis protocol used by Collins et al, which was the previously, it was the largest randomized control trial done with patellofemoral pain, and photothesis was one of the key interventions used in that study. So the HIP protocol, what it consisted of was four weeks doing 12 supervised treatment sessions, so three times a week. We gave no home exercises with it, meaning the person came into the clinic and did their exercises with the physio supervising, and we did that to ensure that we got good adherence, but also we could make sure they did the exercises properly and we could record it. We want to make sure that, you know, we're trying to tick all the boxes here. There was four exercises this included using elastic band for resistance and exercises were done both on the left and the right leg. Each repetition had a five second time under tension. So every rep 
five seconds, the muscle is under tension. It was two seconds concentric, a one second isometric hold, and then two seconds eccentric, with a one second rest in between. We also ensured that the exercises were working them hard, so we could adjust the resistance and use different grading of uh, elastic band to make sure they worked hard. And they were reporting somewhere between a five to seven on the Borg RPE scale, so hard to really hard with the exercises. The four exercises, number one was hip abduction and side lying. And you can see that the resistance tubing was placed just superior to the malleoli, and the physiotherapist was monitoring, making sure they're moving through good movement and also uh, staying still at the pelvis. Second one was doing hip external rotation and 30 degrees of hip flexion. The rationale for 30 degrees was that at the point the heel strikes the ground, you're approximately in about 30 degrees of hip flexion relative to the trunk. So this was why we were looking to write, let's try and strengthen and do some exercise with this muscle in this sort of position here. The third exercise was doing hip abduction and standing. And I just need to note that yes, the hip moved, the leg moved laterally, but also slightly posterior as well. And the foot was slightly internally rotated in. Purpose was to really target that posterior lateral hip musculature. The fourth one was doing hip extension and standing. The person started with approximately 45 degrees of hip flexion and then extended back into a more neutral position. Didn't go fully all of the way back, but they wanted to make sure it was just pure hip uh, on pelvis movement, that there was no lumbo pelvic compensation as they're doing the hip extension. The photothoses protocol. Now these were prefabricated photothoses off the shelf, off the box, you know, straight out of the box. The physiotherapists had the ability to modify the hardness of it, the volume of it. So you can see there's a selection of different orthoses that they could use, full length, three quarter, and also an easy fit option. But it fitted on, it must be comfortable. And they were allowed to modify it using different wedges at different points and also heat guns to try and soften it. And the entire focus was that this photothesis must be comfortable. They're also supplied what you may call or in the UK as a flip-flop. In Australia, it's called a thong. But if I'm going to go with my New Zealand, it's called a jandal. All right. So they were provided with a contoured jandal as well. Uh, and there was also something that they could wear around outside as well. So if they couldn't wear a shoe, they could also wear this jandal um, as well. They also had some home exercises to be working on and you know, some gentle arch forming, oops, go that way, arch forming exercises and also some calf stretching that they had to do daily. Now the group, once they were recruited, were stratified into subgroups. Those that presented with more than 11 millimeters or more of midfoot width mobility, we defined them as a highly, a high mobility group. And they were subgrouped into that. Those with less, they were called low. So when it came to the sample size calculation, we were trying to test for a really strong effect. We weren't looking for something small or maybe we wanted to make sure, look, if this is going to be true, if this is a true treatment effect modification, that there was this big interaction effect. There was a big difference that the foot mobility interacted really well with the foot orthoses and they had a really strong success relative to the others. So on the assumption based on previous literature, we were assuming about 20% of our population that we recruit are going to be high mobile. We ended up with a total number of 220 participants and this allowed for about 15% lost to follow up. Our primary outcome measure was a global rating of change. Um, it was a self-reported measure, seven point Likert scale and our primary time point was at 12 weeks. That was our key point of interest. Those that reported that they were better or much better, we defined them as a successful outcome. Less than that, you know, that was an unsuccessful outcome in our eyes. To kind of further support that primary outcome, we selected a big wide range of secondary outcome measures as well. Now these first three I've put up are patient reported ones. It's their thoughts, their evaluations. The Borg is a self-reported, sorry, the Borg. The Grok is a self-reported scale. We were using, using other ones to help support that finding as well. So we used a thing called a single assessment numerical evaluation which is just dead simple. It's a scale of zero to 100%. So we asked them, look, on a scale of zero to 100%, how normal do you feel your knee is? Later on, after the treatments, we say, look, you know, how much recovery do you feel that you've achieved during this process? The pass or the patient acceptable symptoms state was a simple yes, no question. Look, are your, is your current situation, your current symptoms satisfactory and are you happy to accept them as they are? Yes or no? but also their perception of treatment success. Did they feel that the treatment for them was a successful outcome? 
and did that match well with what we defined as a successful outcome. In support of that, we've used traditional questionnaires that are commonly used within patellofemoral pain, such as the anterior knee pain scale, or more commonly known as the Kujala scale. And the others are listed there, but I also just want to draw your attention to the knee injury and osteoarthritis outcome scale uh, score, and it's made up of five separate subscales as well. So there's another one within that. We also collected some psychological studies, uh, psychological studies questionnaires that looked at sort of kinesiophobia, anxiety, depression, um, and pain catastrophizing measures. We also did look at performance tests, and particularly we looked at um, you know, isometric hip strength of the abductors, the adductors, and the external rotators. We re recorded the strength at baseline and at follow-ups. And, and we also did um, tests that normally aggravate the joint, uh, the patellofemoral joint and cause patellofemoral pain, you know, step ups, step downs, and squats. The number that they could do pain-free before they started to experience their symptoms to see how much they changed. We also took other classic you know, foot measurements such as you know, navicular drop, foot posture index, great toe extension as well. So we collected some other sort of baseline measurements as well, uh, sort of standard characteristic measurements. If we look at the flow of the study, you know, we assessed over 2,000 people for eligibility, you know, excluded obviously a lot, and we ended up in including 218 people into the study. Two were erroneously included and they were removed from the study. Now, all baseline assessment was done by a blind assessor. assessor. All of the measurements that we talked about, that person was blind to A, their stratification, and B, the treatment that they received. If we quickly look at across the study, across all of this, this is kind of the, the split that we got. We had a much higher female representation in this population, and the average age was give or take around about 27 years. The rest of the stuff is presented there, but the key thing I want to draw your attention to is the duration of symptoms. I said to you earlier that more than four months was associated with a poor prognosis. On average, our population was reporting symptoms for 53, 54 months. So you're looking four to five years, on average, these people have been having patellofemoral pain. Doesn't bode well if I'm saying less than four months is a poor prognosis, but here we go. All right, lovely. Um, so, we had a second assessor coming in doing midfoot width measurements. Uh, they were blind to all the baseline measurements that were taken. That person came in and they then measured the midfoot width, took that measurement and then subgrouped them into high or low mobility. Once they were then subgrouped, they were then randomly allocated to the treatment groups, the treatments that they received. So we had 49 with high that were subgrouped, uh, randomized to treatment and 169 that were low, also randomized to treatments. We did a midpoint follow-up at six weeks and we did a uh, uh, final follow-up was at 12 weeks post intervention, uh, 12 weeks from when they started the study. Now the outcome assessor was blind to both the treatment that they received and to the subgrouping that they had been put in. We ended up only losing 11% of our population, which is pretty good given that we accounted that we thought we'd have about 15% lost to follow-up. But here was a really lovely thing and the importance of why we did supervise the exercises. We had a really high adherence to our, to our treatments. You know, most people, for 90, most people attended 92% of their foot orthoses um, sessions and wore the orthoses or the flip-flop thong jandle uh, for 74% of the waking hours. But with regards to the hip exercises, they attended 84% of their sessions. And that's really lovely because we know that we got really strong adherence to this. So here we go, the results. The bit you've all been waiting for and I've taken some time to get to, but it's good to explain the rationale behind it. What you're looking at here is the pure head-to-head -head of the two treatments. If someone presents with patellofemoral pain, where do I start? You know, what is the best treatment to start someone off? Is it a shot with photothesis or hip exercise, and which one is the best? Remember, we define success as those that reported better or much better. Here we go. there was no difference in outcome between either treatment. Okay. The lovely thing about this is that our foot orthosis results were comparable to what Collins had also reported as well. So we know that our findings are really strong and that's been shown within previous literature. If we look at the hip exercises, and we use one of the largest randomized control trials done that looked at that, it was 199 people. Once we adjusted, because they used different outcome measures, once we adjusted ours, so they used different primary outcome measure or definition of success. So when we adjusted ours to match theirs, we actually found that our results were extremely comparable to theirs as well. So what that means is that 
foot authorities and hip exercises seem to offer benefits equally. There's no one is superior than the other. And this was in a group of a, sub, a group of 99 versus a group of 98. So big numbers that we're looking at here. The second aim of the study was to look at this midfoot width mobility. And again, just to re refresh you, more than 11 millimeters, 11 meters or more we defined as mobile, less than a millimeter, 11 millimeters we would define as stiff or sort of low mobility. Our primary outcome measure was the same, was looking at you know, success was better or much better. So here we are. If we look at the foot orthoses group, we've got the mobile and the stiff. What happened? We found the opposite, was that those with the stiff foot actually had a higher success rate with foot orthoses. That this cutoff or this dichotomy of 11 millimeters or more means that you'll suggest you'll have a greater success with foot orthoses. It didn't hold, unfortunately. If we look at the same with the hip exercises, the sort of midfoot width mobility, you know, you may think that a stiff or a low mobility foot, look, you shouldn't need foot orthoses, you're gonna need hip exercises. Again, we actually saw something similar here was that midfoot width mobility wasn't really associated with success with hip exercises. So sort of across the board, this dichotomy, this cutoff of 11 millimeters doesn't really indicate if you're gonna to respond to foot orthoses or hip exercises, there's no real thing around that that would guide you around either way. But here's the thing, we cut off, we had this dichotomy, this black and white, 11 millimeters more success, less, no it doesn't. Well, maybe we got that slightly wrong. Maybe that there's a, the measurement slightly less than that may have a higher success rate. So what we looked at here was sort of, you know, the relationship between, you know, those that reported a successful outcome or, you know, where they rated across the global rating of change and their midfoot width mobility. And if this was true, if it was strong, we should see a nice sort of linear line and an R squared value of one. What we found was almost a horizontal line uh, and an R squared value that was extremely small, which shows that there, there was no relationship anywhere. It doesn't matter what your midfoot width mobility was, it didn't really match well whether you reported a successful outcome with full orthoses. And this was also true again with hip exercises and true again across the entire cohort. But let's look at our secondary outcomes. You know, we had 20 something of them, 26 if I recall properly, uh, different secondary outcome measures. And what we found within the CUS or the knee injury osteoarthritis outcome, which score, which has five subscales, was that we found that a p-value that was associated with three of the five. But here's the thing is, and this, sorry, this favored hip exercises over foot orthoses in the pure head-to-head -head relationship. But here's the thing, just because it was p-value was less than 0.05 and it, you know, it doesn't mean it's actually clinically relevant. And it's questionable whether these scores and what we found actually has any carryover and is clinically relevant. You could talk about, think about the, what we say, the minimal clinical um, differences or you know, how much of a change of score before that comes clinically relevant. And these were kind of borderline to suggest, look, yes, they were shown, but maybe they're not really actually clinically relevant or strong enough that you should carry them through. Across 22 different outcome measurements, we found no evidence of difference between the groups on the pure head-to-head -head or with the foot mobility. And that was the same with all the patient reported scores, the acceptable, the treatment success. That was the same across the rest of the questionnaires. There was no difference between the two treatments. And that was also true with the performance tests. When we looked at hip strength, pain-free measurement, pain-free functional tasks, and also other characteristics around the foot there was no difference or no association between them. But some of you may be questioning this, well, look, your hip exercise program wasn't actually long enough. You should have done more of it to, you know, to, to look for a bit of effect. If you'd done more, you may have actually found something. So we went back and actually looked and I've brought this paper up already as the FERBA paper it was 199 people randomized control trial and they allocated them to either hip and core exercises versus knee focused exercises and the treatment of patellofemoral pain. Now within the hip group, 80% reported a successful outcome to six weeks of hip and core exercises. Now there was a mixture of supervised and home exercises um, and they had to do them at least six times a week in that study. But here's the thing, their success was defined by a decrease of two or more on a visual analog scale, you know, and a change of two or more. So someone that moved from say a seven to a four out of 10 pain, that was a success, okay? 
or if you use the anterior knee pain scale um, or the Kujala scale, if they had an increase in eight points across that um, uh, questionnaire. So there was the two definitions of success. You had a change in pain or a change in score or both. Okay, and that was how they defined success. But here's the thing, with that six week protocol, doing them six days a week and supervised and home exercises and you know, a, quite a, a body of, ex, of strength work that they had to do, they noted an 8% increase in hip external rotation strength and an 11% increase in hip abductor strength. So if we compare the FOX trial to that, you know, and we adjust our, our success rates to the same to match theirs, because we took the same questions uh, and we adjust ours to match to theirs and to find success in the same manner, we actually had a 71% success rate based on that same thing. This is the hip group, 71% success with four weeks of exercises done three times a week. We also noted an increase in strength, okay? That the hip external rotation increased by 11% from baseline and there was an increase of 6% in the hip AB ductor strength. But here was the interesting thing. As I've mentioned before, we took measurements at sort of a midpoint of six weeks. So they started, did their four weeks of exercises and we saw them two weeks later at the six week time point, like a midpoint assessment, and then saw them again at 12 weeks. What we noted was that the strength gains were maintained across the 12 weeks. Now this occurred despite them ceasing the exercises at four weeks and we gave no guidance for them to continue on with doing the exercises. So it seemed to be the strength gains that they seemed to have got within four weeks and we saw at six weeks carried across to 12 weeks despite not doing the exercises. So here we are. What was the clinical kind of implications of this entire study, the entire webinar and things that I'm hoping that you're getting from this you know, session and will hopefully spur, uh, spur in a lot of good questions that come from today. Hip exercises and photothoses offer equal benefits across a wide range of scores, patient reported, questionnaires and physical tasks as well, functional tasks. But this idea that we can individually tailor treatment based on midfoot width didn't hold true and that midfoot width is not a valid standalone patient characteristic to select midfoot for select photothoses for hip exercises. So this is where we're at. We'll kind of, you know, you know, well, hang on, this still doesn't answer my questions. Like, well, hip exercises and photothoses offer equal benefits. So this is where we suggest, well, actually discuss that with your patient, offer it to them, talk about this stuff, maybe see what they prefer. Well, you can say, well, look, the evidence shows that both of these are good. Uh, what do you think? So talk it through with them, but also they, they do come with a re, you know, resource requirement and a time commitment. Can they engage and do the exercises three times a week and work you know, hard to really hard with these exercises? Perhaps if they're a bit more limited, perhaps photothesis is the way to go, knowing that both of them in the early management of patellofemoral pain offer sort of a similar success rate or similar benefits. Thank you. I hope it's been really enlightening for you. I hope it's been able to connect a few dots. I hope that there's been light bulbs where you had some light bulbs, something else has switched on, or maybe shed a bit of light on some biases that you've had in the past as well. I hope that through all of this work that we've done, you've been able to connect a few more dots, maybe link a few things, and oh, I have an idea now about how I can manage patellofemoral pain. And my next person that comes through, I can start to use some of these reports through. I have to fully acknowledge, yes, I've got the ability to present this to you today, but this has been a huge team effort to get the cogs of this um, trial done and to go through. And it's really important that I acknowledge all of these people and there's many more that have contributed towards this whole process to get this study done. Without them, these things wouldn't be possible to do, as well as the financial support that we've received along the way. You know, extremely grateful for things that have been done. I'm very thankful for all the participants who engaged in the study and fully appreciate everything that they did as well as the treating physiotherapist that we had in Brisbane and in Oldbrook who gave up their time to help us run this study. So the question to us all, you know, where to now? What, what's the next thing we do within management of patellofemoral pain, the sort of evolution of knowledge? Look, there's so many more dots that can be connected within patellofemoral pain, so many more things to think about and sort of connect within the body, but also things sort of outputs outside of the body and external factors that may influence upon them. So there's a lot of dots to try and link up and we're nowhere there fully complete, but we're building on it. We're evolving and we're learning more as we go. 
Uh, these are my contact details. If, any, if I've brought up any ideas or research or literature or references that you may have seen, then you'd like them. These are my contact. This is my Twitter handle and also my Ulster University email address. If you've got anything that you would like or things that, um, that you've seen today you want to discuss, please do feel free to reach out uh, and we'll go from there. Lovely. So I guess at this point, it's um, question time. Uh, we've reached that point there. Thank you very much, uh, Mark, for that uh, presentation uh, quite in detail. So um, and there have been some questions coming through, um, some really nice ones, uh, as is the case with these webinars. Um, so uh, I think everyone can see what the questions are. The, the one that's been upvoted most is, um, do you think combining both hip strengthening exercise and foot orthosis may enhance your results? And there's, um, and then the other question is, has anyone looked at combining hip exercise and foot orthosis? So do you think combining them is beneficial and has anyone done it? Uh, that, yeah, that's a, it's a valid question. It's a valid point to ask is like, look, let's just, you know, scattergun, let's just chuck everything at them. Uh, and let's look to see what happens. It's actually been done before to, to an, a, a relatively good degree with the Collins paper in um, the 2008 one I've mentioned. So that was four different treatment, uh, sorry, <clears throat> four different treatments was foot orthoses, was a three mil, just a piece of foam that was put through. It was a McConnell approach, which involved sort of a knee exercises and some things as well. And then the fourth one was actually both. It was, it was combined foot orthoses and hip exercises. Um, and this is work obviously done by Bill, and I can see Bill's uh, smiling away here. But, um, you know, and it showed that there was a slightly, you know, that it did have a slightly greater benefit, but I don't think it was significantly different to the outcome of just foot orthoses or the exercises. So, you know, it is a good point. Look, just try both with them. But I think coming back to the point and saying, well, actually, look, what does the patient want? What can they do? What can they engage with? From a clinical point of view, yes, we can try both. Whether it's going to give us 100% success rate, I don't think so, is my honest opinion. I think it may give us slightly higher success, but still, I don't think it's going to give us much more than what we have seen from there. If, if I could chime in, um, Natalie did a systematic, Natalie Collins did a systematic review which showed that on a pain score, adding the McConnell program with orthoses um, at six months from memory got an SMDS standardized mean difference around 0.8. Whereas just McConnell versus placebo was more around about 0.4. So um, something that's escaped, um, mainly because it's only in one study, the consensus statements, is that um, you know, adding the thosis to McConnell um, might give you a better long-term result. Mm -hmm. um, but it's the McConnell one which is the key thing, not the orthoses, because that six months of thosis by themselves is not as good. So it's just a little nuance in that. It's only one study and um, you know, not as strong as all the other studies put together. But um, in essence, you know, yep, it hasn't really been done well yet. Um, uh, yep, good answer for that. We have a comment from uh, Ashley uh, who says, no, on average, symptom onset was 54 months. Was there any different in results with participants with earlier onset symptoms? So what, what uh, can you recall from your data? I actually can't recall that, to be absolutely honest. I don't think that we actually looked at that or sort of, you know, breaking it up to look at the relationship between duration of symptoms. I know that uh, on average was 54, and that seemed to be quite a consistent thing. And we had an older population. By that, I mean they were 27. And we know that this is a condition that comes on earlier in life. You know, people in adolescence kind of kind of report these symptoms. And it's not until further on down their life it starts to really start to impact them a lot more, perhaps a bit sooner. But um, I actually cannot recall the results or if we actually looked at that. Bill, are you aware if we oh, looked at that? I was hoping you would know. Um, I think <laughs> because, because duration, is a, duration is a prognostic indicator, um, I'm quite confident that the statistician included them as a covariate and there was no, no impact of that on, on it. But as you mentioned, these are older people and on the whole, there's not many with, with low uh, durations, so it may not have been a valuable ass, um, assessment. But between the groups, um, onset of symptoms didn't make a difference, is my recollection. Um, but the paper would, would have that, I think, although some of these papers, you have to cut a lot of that stuff out. Um, I think you're right. I think we, we did look at 
duration and that there was no association between length of duration and uh, successful outcomes, but uh, just not entirely sure on that one. I'll have to check that. Okay, now Ben Smith's got a few good questions and as <laughs> hey, ben, ben, he'd have, hey, how you going, buddy? He'd have uh, some probing ones. So this one here is a good one. No, with no weight and C group, could it be hip exercise and foot orthosis are equally ineffective? So they're no different, but are they equally ineffective? Okay, and that's a good question. One of the things that we talked about when we designed this study is like, look, should we have a control group? Like we've got foot orthosis, hip exercises, but should we have a control group, just a pure weight and see and see what happens in subgroup there? Um, and as soon as we added that thought to the to the, the sample size calculation, it blew it out of the water. You know, it, it actually just made it far too unfeasible to one run the study. But I think the crucial thing is actually a lot of the studies been shown before that these treatments on their own, you know, foot orthoses versus weight and see, which was um, Mills, Cat Mills, 2012 paper, showed that there was a much higher success rate with foot orthoses versus just a pure weight and see approach. Um, and we know that this is a condition that just doesn't get better with just pure weight and see. There's so much evidence to show that this sticks around. It doesn't get better with rest. So you could say, look, without a control group, we can't say that, and that, that would be actually accurate. But I think based on the evidence from previous studies and previous shown is that when you compare this to a wait and see, you know, full orthoses or hypocytes wait and see, both of them are much more effective. And the wait and see just still have these sort of persistent symptoms that travel through. So yes, we could have added it to it, but then the study becomes more unfeasible. It's just not realistic or it's too big to do. Um, but that is a valid reason, it's a valid point, but I feel very confident based on previous literature, previous evidence, and what we know about patellofemoral pain, that a wait and see option, you know, these exercises are far more superior than just pure wait and see. Cool, thanks for that. Yeah, um, so many of our conditions that we look at musculoskeletal do uh, wax and wane, and sometimes you wonder if doing nothing and just looking at them, uh, the treatments do any better. So good question, Ben. Um, Sorry, and I don't know that one. <laughs> is that me or someone else? Anyway, I think I think I think that someone's Alexa kicking in, and I should I should record that and use that for one of the answers to my questions. Uh, it, uh, okay. Um, gotta love gotta love Alexa because uh, even Alexa. Oh, sorry, everyone. That's my wife's Alexa over in the corner. Um, so, so I've just disconnected Alexa. her, and hopefully it doesn't come back to bite me. I'm very sorry about that. Um, Alexa doesn't Alexa doesn't know all the answers either, so I'm happy about that. <laughs> Oh, okay. Um, moving right along then, and Ben's, uh, like I said, Ben's got a few ones, and this has been uploaded just recently. Um, so how many people didn't, uh, how come so many people didn't meet the inclusion criteria? What were the main reasons? Uh, so you had something like about 2,000 come down to 200, so you could end up with 10%. So 90% didn't make the study. Can you recall, I know it's in the flow chart in the paper, can you recall um, um, what some of the reasons for exclusion were because this is a valid this is a valid uh, question when you're it is coming a, to uh, implementing these findings it is a valid question and this is the reason i put this into the flow chart because these were um well actually that doesn't help did not meet inclusion criteria i actually thought i listed it the the key ones one of the biggest ones was actually they had concomitant injuries there was some sort of other underlying thing and one of the most common ones that we saw was you know they presented with patella tendon type pain or patella, patella tendon issues. You know, that they sort of got pain on doing knee extension activities and sort of more hyperextension. So suggesting that there was a real degree of fat pad sort of irritation uh, was the problem. Now some may say, well, look, actually fat pad is patellofemoral pain. But these people got, you know, pain under different sort of presentations or different activities that made their knee. Uh, and the other one was actually that had done, they had done hip exercises before. But one of the most common ones was actually that had knee injuries, you know, some sort of meniscal injury or some sort of tear. There's some sort of degree of laxity in and around the knee. Uh, and I remember that being one of the most common things. You could just pick up this laxity or they reported having some sort of tear in an MRI that was done on them. And I guess the other thing to remind everyone is that we recruited from the general population through uh, social media and advertisements. So, um, you know, there's a fair percentage of these people that just aren't, like you said, aren't patellofemoral pain. So um, yeah, rather yeah. than going through clinics where people turn up with pain. Often when you're advertised for a treatment, you know, be involved for treatment for knee pain, you get a lot of people writing in with all sorts of histories. So, mm -hmm. uh, and they're, they're captured within those that were excluded. Yep. Another good question that came in really early first and it's been upvoted is, 
by Ron. Why do car why do why doing calf stretches? Any indication? Generic for all patients? Gastrocensilis query. Um, yeah, so that was part of the Collins 2008 paper that their protocol that we followed through was doing a, a degree of calf stretching. Um, and that was, um, it's in the protocol paper, uh, the, the pictures and the exercises they had to do. But it was, uh, you know, straight knee um, against the wall. So sort of a standard gastroc or triceps psoro type stretch. Thought being is that, look, if you've got this degree of greater mobility, that the calf muscles are having to work harder, that sort of develop some sort of tension in and around the calf. So like you're trying to relax the muscles off, you're trying to sort of get greater, you know, or sort of release the tension, so to speak, in the calf. Photothosis is helping that one as well. So it was a straight knee, um, triceps psoriae or gastroc stretch, if you want to call it that. Uh, and the thought was that well, that was what came through from Collins, but also it's thought to help kind of relief some of the calf tension that people often report with this condition. And yeah, um, tight calves and lack of tail dorsiflexion is one of the things that makes orthotics very uncomfortable. So that's why we did it in the Collins paper study um, from memory. Um, thanks for these questions, they're coming in thick and fast. Do you think that increasing intensity of the exercise could have made a difference or different exercise in weight bearing positions? It's, uh, that's a really good question. Um, and it's one that I often get, well, look, where do you start? What's the first exercise that you give somebody? People may say things like doing, you know, the crab, uh, not the crab, um, clams or lying on the bed. It, it's too easy. It's not hard enough. It's not intense enough. It's not loading the muscle up enough. But often we find is that people have, you know, for want of a better description, a real reduced capacity uh, or a weird lack of awareness around these muscles, you know, and what they're kind of doing within the hip. So, you could look to say, look, should I be doing more functional training or should I look, start off with the very basics first and then progress them through from there. So we went with the approach of actually starting with the basics first, starting to get some awareness, some movement, coordination, some awareness on how to use the sort of postulateral muscles and then start to progress them through. And our target was like, where do you start with somebody? And let's start with the real basics with a simple four week protocol that yes, in clinic, you would then progress, you would build and you'd move up from there. But what we went with was just a simple, this is where you're gonna start, start with a really nice simple basic one and then you could progress through there. Whether we may have seen different outcomes if we increased the intensity or if we'd chosen different exercises, you know, my gut feeling, personal belief, you know, just to put that hat on, I don't think we would have seen much of a change in the first four weeks. Yes, there are different exercises you can use, but if the person can't perform them well, if they load up the pain, if they keep their symptoms persistent, it can actually become more of a detriment. Hence, that's why we stripped it right back to nice, simple, basic stuff. Start there, and then you can build on from that sort of thing. So I don't think intensity would have changed our outcome, and that's why we chose those specific exercises from there. Cool. Um, now some of our students are starting to ask questions, which is good. Um, apart from Zach Arsenal, apart from foot width, do you think there are any other characteristics that could be explored into the future which may indicate a focus over hip strengthening? Okay, yep. Um, so let's just shoot back to this one. This will just help support the talk a bit more. Make your slides. So was this... What's that, sorry? Yeah, just make your uh, good, yep. Yep, you can see it. Lovely. So this was looked at the, the systematic review that we looked back and looked at treatment effect modifiers. And as I said, there was six treatments across 12 studies. Six studies looked at photothoses. 14 of those were associated with a successful outcome with photothoses. And things that were reported were such as navicular drop, which is the change in height of the navicular uh, to see how much that drops through. So I guess that's some degree of movement of just a single bone or a single sort of uh, point on a bone. Uh, other things like ankle dorsiflexion, uh, range of motion was also something else that was suggested as well. So look, we looked at one, but that movement itself, the midfoot width mobility captures a lot of what's happening through the entire foot. The vicular drop is focused just purely on one bone. Midfoot width is kind of trying as best to capture movement across one plane. But it is important to acknowledge it is, you know, foot mobility is a three dimensional movement and it's really hard to get a simple clinical measure that can measure all of that. So we did look at navicular drop. We looked at foot posture index. We looked at ankle dorsiflexion. You know, we, we looked at midfoot width. We also captured arch height as well. So change in arch height or difference in arch height. Um, and none of those 
were associated either. Right, so our primary focus in subgrouping was midfoot width, but we did capture other foot characteristics and they weren't associated with a successful outcome as a standalone measure. But one thing I think is worth, and perhaps that's where we can move forward with the future is, look, there is definitely a subgroup of people who do respond well to foot orthoses. You know, that's true. We just haven't yet worked out how to best identify them. And maybe it's actually a cluster of clinical measurements that we can use. Maybe that may have an associated outcome with success. And that's one of the things we may go back and look through all of the data that we collected and start to look at perhaps a cluster of two or three, maybe four different measurements to see how they actually respond. And there's this sort of cluster suggestive that, look, if you've got these factors, then you're more likely to have an outcome rather than just a simple standalone measure. Good question uh, and definitely something worth, you know, that we need to keep pursuing further. Thanks, Mark. Good one, Zach. Um, you're going to get top marks in your class now. James has asked the question, and those who are prescribed foot orthoses, if the treatment is successful, in other words, you know, they feel a lot better, uh, totally better, would you suggest to wean off the orthoses or continue to wear them? Uh, that's an interesting effect because you're thinking of, along those lines of actually the mechanism effect of a foot orthosis. You know, if you've got a foot orthosis that you've got something that foot orthosis is contributing to something, you should wean off them. Um, Look, we actually, you know, there's no evidence to say how actually photosynthesis do work. The mechanism effect, there's a lot of different mechanisms and everything really is focused on comfort, you know, and the evidence has been shown that, look, photosynthesis can have an impact in the short term for pain and modify pain from there. Uh, it's an interesting question. Should you wean them off them? Uh, we published, Bill and I published a chapter in a book around for clinical reasoning around midfoot width mobility as sort of an indicator, as a case study. Uh, and it was a lady that we saw, saw and treated, and actually she far preferred the foot exercises, you know, and we modified and progressed foot exercises for her and took the thoses away. Now that was based on, she kind of didn't like them, they were comfortable, but by doing something around the foot, the exercises, some sort of active intervention, she actually had a good successful outcome with that. So evidence suggests foot orthoses are good in the short term and that you then progress on from there. My answer is to give you more direct answer. I think it comes down to patient preference. If the person feels that they're helpful, then just keep working with it. But I'd always be looking to sort of build on top of it and keep progressing through. We know they photosynthesis work for the short term, but it's good to keep progressing things along, whether it's exercises around the foot, around the knee, or around the hip to keep working forward from there. Cool, thanks, Mark. Um, I, we're about an hour into the webinar from when it actually started. Um, there are some questions on the list that I think um, could be directed at the panel. Um, there's a few that have been upvoted that uh, I think are particularly for Mark, so we'll continue with these for a little while, but we'll get to the panel shortly, rest assure everyone. Um, so Tim asks, did the participants in the study actually have deficits in hip abduction strength? Uh, on the symptomatic side. Was this measured bilaterally prior to exercise commencement? This would certainly alter the treatment effect. Okay, so the suggestion there is that, and with the rationale is that, look, if someone's not strong enough or there's a deficit or some sort of motor impairment or movement issue, um, and that if you strengthen it, if you address that deficit, and the systematic review done by Michael um, showed that actually the deficit may be as a result of the patellofemoral pain more than sort of caused patellofemoral pain. The question is, or the answer is actually, we don't know what is a true deficit. We don't yet know if someone is strong enough at the hips. You know, what is strong enough? So to identify that they're a deficit or that they're a bit weaker is also relative to the context of what they're doing. So it's hard to know exactly if they're a deficit. But one of the things I'm really interested in is sort of more around symmetry index. You know, left versus right or abductors versus adductor groups. If there's some sort of disparity or something different within a limb symmetry index, if they've got less than, say, and that's been shown with other muscle groups, you know, with hamstring injuries, for example, you know, if there's a greater difference of more or a difference of 15% between the two of them, there may be something around that that can identify deficit. Now, if we can identify that, then we can start to identify as those that are presenting with a deficit, then we can see if hip exercises are the best one for them. And that yet hasn't been explored. You know, what actually is a deficit with the hip muscle that would say, look, you need strengthening exercises. Historically, we may do, you know, lying on the bed, hold the leg up, hold it for as long as you can, you know, and you feel the burn or fatigue, or, you know, we hold the leg up and as physios, we love to wrench on it and give it a push, you know, and see if they can push against you. Crude 
Hence, that's why we use the handheld dynamometers. We did that in supine lying with external belts resistance to hold them in place. Um, have a look at the protocol paper. You'll see how we recorded and measured hip strength. Uh, and then we want to sort of, that's one of the things we may look at with our studies is going to look, is there something around the symmetry index that may identify those that would respond best to hip exercises? So definitely that's another dot of where we need to keep moving and keep evolving our research further. Those that are weak, so to speak. One thing that um, we have done, we haven't published yet, is the statisticians done a moderation and mediation analysis of this data. Um, and uh, it doesn't seem that those that were weak, it doesn't seem hip abduction strength is a moderator. In other words, those that are weaker benefit more or less. Um, so, um, but it makes clinical sense that if someone's weak, you'd strengthen them. Uh, um, but this study um, didn't actually show that. Uh, and there's, you know, just under 100 people in this group, so it's not like a small study where you're likely to have missed something. Um, there's, some, th there's something else um, you've just reminded me of. We uh, looked at hip strength in all groups. So there was those that got the hip exercises, and we looked at their hip strength, you know, at baseline six and 12 weeks. And as I've shown you there, we had an increase in strength. With hip exercises, 11% with external rotation and I think 6% with abductors in response to a four-week program. There was also the other group that got foot orthoses, so a distally targeted treatment. We also took their hip strength values. And at 12 weeks, there was no difference in the hip strength gains. What that suggested was that something targeted at the foot has done something to modify what's happening more proximally up at the hip. The foot orthoses group also got stronger up in the hip muscles and there was no significant difference between the two at 12 weeks, suggesting that maybe the mechanism effect of the treatments is actually through the entire kinetic chain. It could also be symptom modification. We changed the pain, they became more active and therefore they also became stronger as well. So it's something that you would think, you know, if I target the hip with hip exercises, I'll make the hip muscles stronger. But also, you know, what is shown with the study is that also the foot orthoses changed hip strength as well. So an indirect effect. How? Not sure. It could have been a few things. Sorry, Bill. No, 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 you're right, mate. There are some questions coming in about, you know, where would you start and, and et cetera, clinically. We might leave that kind of question when we get to the panel, like um, clinically, what do the panelists feel, um, you know, is the go-to for them and why, so that we can get a, an overall start to that. So I'll leave that the top question here, where does Mark now start with his patients to then, and you could probably kick that off then, Mark. Um, there's another question. Um, why did you exclude 90% of the 2000? I think this has already been answered. Does your group properly reflect the population that presents to physio clinics? So the big thing that I'd like to say here, because I've had this discussion this week, is that um, in Australia, healthcare context, we cannot get any patients through physio clinics. It just doesn't happen. Um, so we just go with people that, just to give you a half a bit of a break, Mark. Um, this is a <laughs> this is Thanks, a I appreciate it. This is a technical thing, essentially. Um, so do the research, we go broader. We do tend to have caveats, like we ask for certain severity, a certain duration of pain that might reflect clinical practice. But when you look at it, our effect sizes for phoses and hip exercise are much like others that have published. And so the effects seem to be robust across uh, populations. Um, whether they represent physio, what, who turns up to physio clinics is not that easy to, to answer from our data. Um, so I might just leave it at that. It's always an issue of, of that external validity. Um, it's a good question. Um, uh, there's a question here, um, Callum asked, uh, he was wondering what were the specific models of prefab insole sandal type shoes that were used. Do you want to answer that one? That's a, a rather straightforward one, I think. Yep. Uh, let's bring the picture up. So these were, the, these were the orthoses that we used. They're prefabricated, off the shelf. Um, they're made with EVA foam. Um, you can see the big long one. That was what we would call a full length. So that goes right into the toe box of the shoe uh, and goes through. There's a heel cup with the sort of supports through there. The second one in, the, the shorter one, 
this one through here, is what we call a three quarter length. Um, and that's for someone who may have a shoe design that actually doesn't allow that foot orthosis and it's too tight at the toes. So you're still looking to try and have that sort of effect around the rear and midfoot region, but the shoe itself doesn't sort of give them the chance to, or it's too tight around the toes. The third option, the small one that you can see at the back, that's what we call an easy fit. And you can see that that, that portion to the outside of the shoe has been cut away. And that's to fit in sort of more type, you know, business shoes that have a real restriction of space where things are, are quite tight to begin with. You still need to fit something in through there. So the physios had this whole range of orthoses that they could use with each individual person. They brought in five to six different pairs of shoes and they were fitted with all these different models to their kind of most common shoes. So the answer is that, look, we had a wide range that you could use, they could be modified. You could put wee wedges up here around the toe. You could put heel wedges um, that also came fitted in. As I say, it was entirely based on making it comfortable. Um, and that was the standard uh, contoured sandal thong jandal that we used um, so that was also an option that was given to them as well so they had a lot of different things that could be fitted to the shoes based on the shoe based on comfort okay. and that was the same as what the Collins paper had done as well so essentially we've used this study used what's been done before and now has been studied the most but we haven't studied different models of uh, different companies models of um, orthoses, um, yeah, so, um, yep, the custom orthoses um, have not been studied in great detail in patellofemoral pain, but um, in other conditions, it doesn't seem to be much benefit from the custom. There's a, a new study coming out that shows it's no better than just usual care to have customised orthoses. One of the problems, of course, with all these orthoses is there's so many different characteristics uh, that different people think are important. Um, most of them are not evidence-based, unfortunately, but which leaves it difficult for clinicians to know what to go with. So we made it pretty clear. It's um, comfortable orthoses that are fitted uh, to a patient that looks like they've got an increased mobility, even though this study doesn't bear that up for the measures that we measured. Um, I'm looking at these questions and I think I might um, do you want to unshare your screen, Mark, and I'll ask the panelists to... Um, Jeez, the, question, the questions are flying in. Uh, good. There's quite um, a few here. Um, yeah, I think, good, good. I don't, I don't want to... Um, here we go. Is that, I stopped sharing. What, 